I'm honoured to give the Gandhi Foundation annual lecture 2020. I spoke at a conference to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the birth of M.K. Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. I heard how Gandhi believed community was central to our development. In turn, I observed how many employee-owned companies make an express commitment to benefit their local communities. The trustees of the Gandhi Foundation encouraged me to look further at Gandhi's ideas and the synergy with employee ownership. I accepted this invitation and since accepting it, this topic has moved centre stage. The COVID-19 pandemic has put wider corporate purpose into the spotlight. The unprecedented interruption to normal business has shown how companies are much more than profit-making vehicles. Even businesses under financial stress have found the resources to look after their employees. They've also shown they are pillars of their communities, providing vital goods and services and enabling employees to help their communities in numerous ways. Fast learned new ways of working may even have provided ways to tackle environmental problems. How can we take the best of this behaviour and ensure companies behave like this all the time? I will explain how the employee ownership business model and in particular the employee ownership trust or EOT controlled company could provide the ideal model for good corporate citizenship and provide a solution to problems that have vexed policymakers even before the COVID-19 pandemic. I will explore how Gandhi's thought and life and in particular his theory of trusteeship encourages us to change how we define employee ownership so it better meets the needs of society and the environment. Call it employee ownership with added Gandhian purpose. Mahatma Gandhi died over 70 years ago. It's remarkable how experiences in his life remain relevant today. He launched a campaign to improve the lives of Indians in the Transvaal and the Orange Free State after experiencing racial discrimination there. He pioneered, he, he <laughs> on a return voyage to uh, South Africa, he was kept in quarantine because there was plague in Bombay when he set sail. Uh, Gandhi had other experiences of the plague. Well, while pneumonic plague broke out near Johannesburg, he and his clerks nursed terminally ill Indian mine workers in a building they had commandeered. He was involved in moving uh, an Indian township's tenants to a campsite so their township could be burned to the ground to rid it of plague. Gandhi convinced his bank, ma bank manager to accept the township's savings savings usually kept in cash. The unearthed savings had to be disinfected before the bank clerks handled the money. Racism and contagion, how topical these experiences are today. One thing we learn from these experiences is how practical Gandhi could be in solving problems. Another aspect to what Gandhi called his experiments with the truth is also topical. Truth was the sovereign principle for Gandhi. He was heavily influenced by a Hindu scripture, the Gita. Also his training as a barrister had its part to play. When trying to make a particular decision, he observed that Snell's discussion of the maxims of equity came to my memory. I understood more clearly in the light of the Gita teaching, the meaning of trusteeship. It's indicative of how important truth was to him that his first public speech was on truthfulness in business. 
This is something which is part of Gandhi's theory of trusteeship. Gandhi's insights on trusteeship can provide us with encouragement, uh, dare I say enlightenment, as we consider the future of the corporation, and in particular the employee-owned corporation in these difficult economic times, times in which pre-existing fragilities have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Gandhi was critical of capitalism, as he was of communism. He isn't the obvious starting point for providing a better way to run a trading company. However, those familiar with employee ownership, and especially the Employee Ownership Trust, will, I hope, share my interest in what we can learn from Mahatma Gandhi and his theory of trusteeship. I've mentioned how practical Gandhi could be. It is accepted that um, his theory of trusteeship was never fully formed, and in particular, he hadn't formulated clear ideas about its practical application. So trusteeship is very much a theory. As Lord Parrot explains in his study of Gandhi's political philosophy, Gandhi's theory of trusteeship is an economic extension of his philosophical concept of man as a trustee of all he had. As Gandhi imagined it, every industrialist was to look upon his industry not as his property, but as a social trust. Gandhi wrote that the capitalist is to regard himself as a trustee for those on whom he depends for the making, the retention and the increase of his capital. As to the wealthy, each wealthy person must know that all that wealth does not belong to me. What belongs to me is the right to an honourable livelihood, no better than millions of others. The rest of my wealth belongs to my community and must be used for the welfare of the community. Although it was primarily entrepreneurs to uphold trusteeship, workers too had responsibilities. Gandhi said to workers, each of you should consider himself to be trustee for the welfare of the rest of your fellow labourers and that you should treat the business of your employers as if it were your own business and give it your honest and undivided attention. Let's pull these ideas together. George, George Goyder, CBE, writing in 1979, summed up the theory of trusteeship in a way that would hold its own at any contemporary conference on corporate purpose. The Gandhian concept of trusteeship expresses the inherent responsibility of business enterprise to its consumers, workers, shareholders and the community and the mutual responsibilities of each to the other. Gandhi's later iterations of his trusteeship theory are radical one is set out in a document prepared by Professor Dantwala and others to which Gandhi made amendments. It envisages a possibly state-regulated trusteeship with limited private ownership of property and limits on how much the higher paid earn, under which an individual will not be free to hold or use his wealth for selfish satisfaction or in disregard of the interests of society. There have been periodic attempts to give practical expression to Gandhi's theory of trusteeship. Mostly involves scaling back from its more radical form to focus on business and how business might adopt trusteeship. These attempts all resonate with debates today about corporations needing a broader purpose beyond profit making. A 1965 conference in Delhi on trusteeship resulted in a declaration that there should be an increasing association of management with the workers. One way of doing this is by sharing profits and its reinvestment in the company through purchases of the company's shares to be held in trust or by other means. 
which serve to identify the worker with his work and give him an interest in the company. Again, it was emphasised that workers have obligations. Likewise, workers should recognise their obligation to do a good day's work for a good day's wage, to cooperate on increasing productivity, to come forward with suggestions and to participate responsibly in the life of a plant community. These statements would not be out of place at an American National Centre for Employee Ownership Conference or the UK's Employee Ownership Association. Draft trusteeship laws were promoted in India periodically from 1967, but never enacted. These bills proposed the concept of trust corporations being companies the owners of which have declared themselves to be its trustee in the manner set out in the bill. A 1979 conference in India to review trusteeship concluded that little of significance had happened since 1965. Interestingly, the English law concept of an employee trust received little attention. Speakers explained the UK's common ownership movement. The John Lewis partnership uh, was mentioned, but the potential for its trust ownership structure to be adopted as a way of giving practical expression to Gandhi's theory seemed to be missed. Instead, there was a general acceptance that no one legal model would serve uh, for a responsible enterprise that would work for all. The John Lewis Partnership and the charity-owned Scott Barder Company were called pioneer experiments. There were disparate approaches to employee ownership in the UK at that time, in that pioneering time. And so it's understandable how no particular model emerged as a way of putting Gandhi's theory of trusteeship into practice. Why did Gandhi wish to see these changes in how businesses were owned and operated? Reading again from Lord Farrick's leading work, Gandhi believed capitalism had dehumanised both workers and capitalists and lowered the level of human existence. His theory of trusteeship was intended to avoid the evils and combine the advantages of capitalism and communism. There are some companies in India that practice uh, trusteeship management, but by and large it's accepted that his theory has not been put into practice on a large scale. Nevertheless, we can still learn from it. If I turn to employee ownership, we have what is demonstrably a tried and tested successful business model. The accounts of the UK's 50 largest employee owned companies in May 2020 showed a turnover of 20.1 billion. Sales were up 4.3% on a like for like basis compared to the previous year's accounts. They had 178,000 employees and operating profits were up 5%. Admittedly, these statistics include a very large employee owned business, the John Lewis Partnership. But what's significant is how employee ownership has taken off among smaller to medium sized enterprises. EO Day 2020 celebrated the best year yet in growing the UK's employee ownership sector. There were over 100 new employee owned companies formed in the 12 months to June 2020. Companies of all sizes in numerous sectors and across the UK are now employee owned. Employee ownership clearly works. We have moved beyond the era of pioneering experiments. What's made such a difference? It's primarily the EOT. The UK employee ownership sector has grown by over 300% since the EOT's introduction in 2014. Well over 90% of that growth has come from companies adopting the EOT ownership model. The 2020 
EO Day theme was hashtag EO is the answer. Increasingly, employee ownership is the answer. Founders looking for a neat exit that doesn't involve selling to a competitor and preserves the ethos of the company can now sell to the trustee of an employee ownership trust. The EOT will hold those shares permanently on behalf of all the employees. The money to buy the company comes from its own profits. Once the founders have been paid, the dividends that would otherwise have gone to investors can be paid out to employees as all employee bonuses. The trustee of the EOT can protect the employees' long-term interests. Increasingly, EO is the answer. It's worth emphasising the flexibility of employee ownership trusts. I appreciate that anyone familiar with EOTs will know much of what I'm about to say, but I believe the supporters of the Gandhi Foundation will find it of interest. EOT ownership can apply to companies, whatever the size of the workforce. Most companies converting to this model have between 10 and 49 employees, but much smaller and larger companies have successfully adopted the EOT business model. There are no complexities from buying and selling individual shareholdings. The collective holding of shares by a trustee company works, whatever the type of workforce and its composition. EOT ownership also works pretty much in whatever the type of business undertaken. A properly established trustee company has few running costs or administrative burdens. The process of moving to EOT ownership does require skillful, experienced advice, but those costs are soon forgotten. The main reason why the structure is elegant is that it is dependent for its success on a readily available resource, its employees. Best practice is to have a paritarian board, one comprising representatives of senior management and the same number representing employees as a whole. Each group can appoint and remove its trustee directors. Also, there is usually an independent chair. Day-to-day -day management remains with the trading company's board, but there may be directors elected or selected onto that trading company board to represent the interests of employees. Typically, there will also be an employee council that works on a regular basis with the trading company board. In this way, the EOT's board of directors is freed up to act as custodian or guardian of the company's employee ownership ethos in accordance with the trustee's fiduciary duties under its trust deed. Overall, there are checks and balances to prevent mismanagement and to promote the success of a business for the benefit of its employees. So, how can Mahatma Gandhi's ideas help us develop this already successful business model? Employee ownership is successful, but what exactly do we mean by employee ownership? In 1987, I helped write the first book on the legal and tax aspects of employee ownership. There was no accepted definition of employee ownership. So I concentrated on who owned the shares in the company. This is what I call employee ownership version one. The book identified three main ways of achieving employee ownership. Firstly, for individual employees to own shares personally. Secondly, for a trust to own shares collectively on behalf of all the employees for the time being. With the employees forming part of being the beneficiaries of that employee trust. And thirdly, a hybrid approach which mixes the two This definition worked well when describing the legal mechanics and the tax consequences of shifting ownership into the hands of employees. 
this definition fitted well with the times and the lobbying ambitions of the Employee Ownership Association, or Job Ownership Limited, as it was then called. By 1987, the UK had a useful array of, of share and share option plans, which allowed executives and other employees to acquire shares personally in their company. Lobbying to promote employee ownership was part and parcel of promoting employee share ownership in all its types, including executive plans. Although tax changes were achieved to promote individual share ownership, none of these acted as a trigger to accelerate the growth of employee ownership. In 2012, the coalition government decided on a review to investigate why employee ownership had not taken off in private companies. The initial announcement of this review wasn't clearly understood in the press. There was an assumption that the government was again looking at individual share ownership. It was obvious that employee ownership needed a new definition. The Nuttall Review of Employee Ownership defined employee ownership in a significantly different way. Call this employee ownership version two. This built on EO version one by including trusteeship ownership as well as direct ownership and hybrid models. But importantly, the definition went beyond looking at who owned shares to requiring that the employee's shareholding underpinned genuine employee engagement. It also made it clear that share ownership by a few executives didn't count. And even if all employees owned some shares in a company, that wasn't enough. The shareholding had to be significant so that it could underpin meaningful employee engagement. This definition helped move employee ownership from being seen as an add-on to the traditional business model to being a business model in its own right. This emphasis also helped move EO from being promoted by reference to the tax system to being seen as something with its own freestanding commercial merits. Employee ownership is good for business success and happier staff. As a result of the findings of the Nuttall Review, the Employee Ownership Trust was introduced in the Finance Act 2014. My review had emphasised the benefits of the trust model of employee ownership. And I argued for a level playing field. Why should there only be tax incentives for individual share ownership? After discussion with HM Treasury, two key tax advantages were introduced. One that provides a complete exemption from capital gains tax for individuals selling a controlling shareholding to the trustee of an employee ownership trust. Secondly, an exemption for cash bonuses paid to all employees of an EOT controlled company. These are income tax free up to £3,600 per employee per tax year. Sellers to an EOT usually have to wait a few years to be paid in full. The capital gains tax exemption is a vital part of making a sale to an EOT work in practice, as well as acting as a nudge to professional advisors to mention this, this exit solution. And the income tax exemption means there's a tangible benefit for employees. As far as I am aware, tax hasn't distorted decision making. I expected there to be an increase in the trust model of ownership following these changes, but I had expected that the direct model would also continue to be popular. But the EOT has turned into the dominant type of UK employee ownership. In 2012, employee ownership version two change the emphasis towards the main trigger of employee ownership's success, genuine employee engagement. Is it timely in 2020 
to adopt an expanded definition of employee ownership that goes further than this. What Gandhi encourages us to consider is a new definition of employee ownership, a bolder definition that defines employee ownership with expanded corporate purpose so that employee owned companies are synonymous with good corporate citizenship. Call this employee ownership version three. As I've explained, a company owned by a few senior directors isn't employee owned. And even if all employees have a small shareholding, that isn't enough. The employee's shareholding must underpin genuine employee engagement. So employees individually and collectively have a voice in that business and how it's run. Why not go further and get to the point of saying that an employee owned company also has to serve society and the environment locally and globally as well as its employees interests. This is unfinished business from the Nuffle Review. I did consider requiring employee owned companies at that time to state a mission and have a limit on pay differentials. I consulted on these ideas. I was impressed by how many employee owned companies had powerful mission statements and how some had expressed limitations to prevent senior management being paid more than a reasonable multiple of annual pay. It seems uncanny at first glance, but in Gandhi's draft trusteeship formula, we find references to fixing both a decent minimum living wage and the maximum income that would be allowed to any person in society. And also the character of production will be determined by social necessity and not by personal whim or greed. But actually it's not so surprising when one of the UK examples of employee ownership I had in mind in 2012 was the Scott Barder Commonwealth. This group was established by Ernst Bader as an express attempt to realise Gandhi's trusteeship principles. Indeed, some in India refer to it as a good example of Gandhi's trusteeship principles. What has changed since the Nutter Review in 2012? That's an easy question to answer, isn't it? EO version one will be a new definition fit for the times in which we live. One in which we have no alternative but to tackle inequality and solve climate change and sustainability problems. Much has changed and has changed quickly. Nationally and internationally, there is a wide ranging set of initiatives to tackle societal and environmental problems encompassing corporate social responsibility, environmental society and governance or ESG criteria, putting purpose beyond profit and so on. There have been well publicised moves by major organisations that demonstrate a major shift away from shareholder primacy. The idea that a successful company is only one that maximises profits to shareholders. It helps to mention briefly a couple of these initiatives to get us thinking about what it might mean in practice for a particular company to have a positive impact on society and the environment. There are global initiatives such as the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by the United State, uh, Nations Member States which has at its heart 17 sustainable development goals, including no poverty, zero hunger, and good health and well-being. As another example, the United Nations supported Principles for Responsible Investment, or PRI, initiative helps integrate ESG considerations into investment decision-making. In relation to environmental issues, PRI highlights climate change, as well as water risk, sustainable land use, fracking, methane as a climate pollutant, and risks associated with plastics. 
social issues highlighted by PRI are human rights and labour standards, employee relations and conflict zones. Governance issues highlighted are tax avoidance, executive pay, corruption, effective director nominations and cyber security risks. There are country specific initiatives. In 2014, a change to Indian company law made it mandatory for larger private and public sector firms to spend at least 2% of their net profits on corporate social responsibility projects as set out in the law. This change was entirely in keeping with Gandhi's trusteeship principle. The list of possible projects includes, as examples, promoting gender equality, empowering women, setting up homes and hostels for women and orphans, setting up old age homes, daycare centres and other facilities for senior citizens. By 2019, social impact spending had grown by 100% in the affected companies. The majority of spending was through intermediate agencies uh, rather than companies' own foundations or direct spending. Education and health and sanitation projects accounted for most of the expenditure. In the UK, certain larger companies now have to include a statement known as the Section 172 statement in their annual report and accounts. This explains how directors have had regard to what are called enlightened shareholder values. These statements set out company specific initiatives. It is too early to tell what impact this additional accountability is having and there are suggestions that additional regulation is needed to help ensure that the reporting is done with integrity and meaning. Certain key issues recur when trying to define what is needed from corporations. To what extent should corporate purpose be integral to how a business operates? If it is integral, how should it rank compared to serving shareholders' interests? And to what extent should achieving a wider corporate purpose be mandatory? And just as importantly, having identified what change is needed, how in practice do you achieve substantive positive change? How does my proposed new definition of employee ownership fit in with these key issues? I see wider corporate purpose as integral to how a business operates. I'm not talking just about worthwhile activities such as ad hoc charitable giving as our add-ons to doing business. And obviously I don't mean using CSR as a means of maximizing profit. My main po point is that employee owned companies need to make changes in how they operate their businesses so as to impact positively on society and environment. This means going beyond compliance with the letter of the relevant ESG laws and innovating to help avoid, mitigate and indeed solve societal and environmental problems. Upholding shareholder value is what UK law sets as the default duty for directors. This duty is, importantly, caveated by the Companies Act uh, 2006, which requires that directors must have regard to various matters, including the impact of the company's operations on the community and the environment. So the directors of an ordinary trading company can, already under UK law, if they wish, take into account corporate interests other than maximising profits. As to how these wider interests rank alongside profit and providing good work, well, I believe that for now there needs to be flexibility. The long process culminating in the Companies Act 2006 considered the idea of changing a director's duty so it is not just about a duty to shareholders, but also to employees, the community 
and the environment. A pluralist approach like this would have forced directors to consider the interests of this wider set of stakeholders in arriving at a decision. Directors would have had to weigh these interests against each other and shareholder interests could lose out. This change was rejected because it would confuse decision making and ran the risk of creating a litigious climate. What exactly does it mean to serve these wider interests? As you will probably have worked out from my earlier example initiatives, in practice you have to move swiftly from concerns at international level, that state level, to look at industry specific concerns and how a particular business can answer this question. What are priorities for one company will not be the same for another. Some companies will find it harder to make a positive impact locally and globally than others. A flexible solution is needed at corporate level. As to compulsion, well, I would like all employee and companies to embrace serving a wider corporate purpose. How they do it would be left to each business, but it would be great to see all employee and companies around the world accepting this obligation. There are calls for all UK companies of whatever type to be required to state their purpose. The director's duty would then be to promote the success of the company. There are renewed calls for a change in director's duties to adopt a pluralist approach, such that social, economic and employee interests are on an equal footing with shareholder profit. There is some momentum around these initiatives. Uh, company law does not readily permit directors to further wider corporate interests at the expense of shareholders. And it may not provide protection to directors that promote purposes beyond shareholder value unless this is expressly permitted under a company's article to association. A 2014 UK government report on corporate social responsibility noted that there was a near equal proportion of respondents who wanted more legislation in this area and those who resisted it. I wonder what proportion in favour of additional legislation there would be now. How novel and radical a suggestion is my expanded definition of employee ownership. It's certainly not new to call for companies to pursue wider purposes. That's part of Gandhi's theory of trusteeship. It's not radical in the employee ownership sector either, in that there are already employee owned companies such as Riverford Organics and Paradigm Norton, which are certified B corporations. This means they have had their standards of social and environmental performance, public transparency and legal accountability verified through the B Corp certification process. They have articles of association that require a company to make a positive contribution to society and the environment, as well as serving shareholders. The success of the certified B Corporation community has encouraged me to formulate my proposal that employee ownership should also involve making an overall positive contribution to society and the environment. We have other examples of how employee ownership combines with wider corporate purpose. Public service mutuals are employee owned companies. Uh, employee led organisations that deliver public services. These are often structured as community interest companies. And of course, worker cooperatives already champion this ideal. Cooperatives are people-centred enterprises owned, controlled and run by and for their members to realise their common economic, social and cultural needs and aspirations. The 2018 Ownership Dividend Report found that a majority of employee-owned companies made explicit commitments 
to contribute directly to their local communities, albeit with an emphasis on providing local jobs. If the ownership effect inquiry was held now, I am confident you would find these same companies talking more broadly about the positive impact employee ownership has on society and the environment. Gandhi has encouraged me to be bold and to propose an all-encompassing idea. He would, I'm sure, want me to be practical in its implementation. He would also, I believe, agree that one step at a time can be good enough. I am not expecting every employee-owned corporation to become a B certified corporation, or indeed to adopt the Articles of Association of the Scott Barder Group, or its unique ownership structure. A mission statement or equivalent document could contain this commitment to enable an overall positive contribution to society and the environment, suitably adapted to the circumstances of each particular business. This wider corporate aim could be succinct. For example, the Useful Simple Group, a group of companies with expertise in engineering, design, architecture and communication. Their objective is to improve the human environment by delivering useful, simple outcomes that are beautiful and good. If you want to get into governance specifics, an employee ownership trust deed could contain a purpose clause that includes these wider purposes. My firm, Field Fisher, already includes as standard a main purpose clause that requires a trustee to ensure the company it controls has good employee engagement. That clause can extend what an employee ownership ethos means to include making an overall positive contribution to society and the environment. This will help overcome company law concerns about whether serving the interests of shareholders is compatible with wider stakeholder concerns. If the 1979 Conference on Trusteeship was reconvened today, possibly the Employee Ownership Trust, with added Gandhian purpose, would be recognised as a model of responsibility, a model of responsible business that can serve for all. Why is this new definition of employee ownership such a good fit for the employee ownership sector? Employee owned companies are most of the way there already. They already take care of their workforce and deliver great customer service. Many are also already taking care of society and the environment. Employee owned systems Employee-owned companies have good systems of governance and accountability to ensure companies will fulfil these wider purposes, systems that can be readily adapted to include a broader corporate purpose. In particular, employee ownership offers the stability of ownership over the long term to, re to achieve these wider purposes. And we need everyone's ideas to tackle social and environmental problems. Employee owners can provide these ideas. This new definition may sound a technical change, but for me it's part of a bigger need. And that's for employee ownership to be recognised as more than just a business model. Franchising is a business model. I want employee ownership to be more than that. What I would eventually like is that employee ownership is an ism, a distinctive belief system that is synonymous with good corporate citizenship. I would like people to be able to say, I believe in employee ownership. And who's encouraged me to think like this? M.K. Gandhi. Gandhi said of his theory of trusteeship that it is no makeshift, certainly no camouflage. I am confident that it will survive all other theories. It has the sanction of philosophy and religion behind it. I can't claim the same of employee ownership, but Gandhi encourages us to be more ambitious in striving towards similar aims. 
we need to see positive changes in society and our relationship with the environment. What better dynamic to make these essential changes than to channel the energies of employee owners towards finding and implementing solutions. The employee ownership sector can become an exemplar for good corporate citizenship by embracing wider corporate purpose a part of what it is to be employee owned. In summary, I would like to see every employee owned company making an overall positive contribution to society and the environment as part of promoting the success of the company. And to make this commitment in the strongest possible terms appropriate to their business. This will be a step on the way to a new definition of employee ownership, one that is synonymous with good corporate citizenship. This would send a strong message to other businesses. They also need to adopt wider corporate purposes. The COVID-19 pandemic has delayed me giving this lecture. I was going to say exactly the same thing before the novel coronavirus intervened. What's different is that every business and individual will now understand more clearly why we need wider corporate purpose. In support of my Gandhi empowered proposal, I can read out in full the Build Back Better UK campaigning statement of what it wants. Let's not go back to normal. It's time for a new deal that protects public service, tackles inequality in our communities, provides secure, well-paid jobs, and creates a shock-proof economy that can fight the climate crisis. Thank you again to the trustees of the Gandhi Foundation for inviting me back and for giving me this opportunity to explain how employee ownership can be redefined with added Gandhian purpose.